When it's all over, will Paris still be Paris? No spring shower could keep the locals away this Wednesday from their first outdoor cafe experience in more than six months. As lockdown eases and before indoor dining resumes, everyone's got their uh, personal checklist. The first museum, the first movie, the first night at the theater or concert. Will it be like before or will the pandemic have altered our social habits? The food industry may certainly never be the same. During the past uh, 15 months, Childish. while the tourists were away, Parisians learned how to use a QR code for ordering from the kitchen. Some have taken to food delivery apps or rediscovered the art of home cooking. Will cafe culture be the same? Will city life be the same? It's not just about those who've uh, ditched public transport for a bicycle. What's become really of all those scarred by confinement in a tiny overpriced apartment and who said, once this is all over, they're going to be leaving the bright lights behind. Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at cafe culture after lockdown. Joining us is uh, from the theater district in the 9th arrondissement of Paris, France 24's uh, Tom Burgess Watson. Uh, Tom, how many cafe crèmes have you had today? <laughs> Not too many, François, but I can tell you it's cod fillet, uh, confit de canard and oysters on the menu where I am. <laughs> All right. We'll talk more about that in a moment. With us as well, former city councillor for Paris's fourth arrondissement, Anne Le Breton. Welcome back to the show. Well, thank you. Uh, Wall Street uh, Journal reporter Matthew Dalton has graced us with his presence. How are you, sir? Good. Thanks. Thanks for having me. All right. And food critic Alexander Lebrano, your upcoming memoir on going native in the culinary capital of the world is entitled My Place at the Table. It's published by Houghton Mifflin. Uh, comes out, uh, when is it, next month? Uh, June 1st. June the 1st. Yeah. All right. Thanks for joining us. The France 24 debate on Facebook and on Twitter. Hashtag F24 debate. Our guests are all in Paris. But it's the same story throughout France. In Marseille, Lyon, Lille, Strasbourg, and in viol le fort population 1,220, this village in the south of France near Montpellier, relieved to see the chairs and tables out at the uh, village's only café. I'm meeting up with friends. We're drinking coffee. It's great. Did you miss it? Oh, yes. Now it's so much nicer. We can talk. It's more enjoyable. We are happy to be together like this and not just on the bike. That's all we have around here. The local bar, and that's it. It's really what we've been missing. So, uh, Anne Le Breton, how's, how's your Parisian Wednesday been? Well, I was like all Parisians, so happy when I got up, went and had a coffee, had lunch outside, and it's it, it, it's true. It, we've been missing the, the cafe so much. It's really a, the center of our culture, and not only in Paris, everywhere. And French people, you know, they 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 always stop uh, after they drop the children off to school, and they stop and have a coffee, and they stop and have a coffee before they go to work, and they meet friends in coffee in cafes. So without the cafes, we were really lost. And so today is a wonderful day. But it's not only the cafes, it's also the cinemas. And in Paris, we're, we're the city with the most cinemas in the world. And so that's something that has, you know, we've been missing terribly also. All right, before I ask Matthew Dalton what's his first movie going to be, uh, Tom Burgess Watson, uh, you've 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 run down the menu for us uh, at that ca uh, where you are. Uh, it is at a restaurant in the ninth arrondissement. Outdoor seating only. Tell us more. Absolutely, François. I'm at uh, Plain West, which is a Breton restaurant in the 9th arrondissement. Quite noisy around here, so it's perhaps uh, an indication of the excitement people are feeling. I get the impression a lot of people meeting up for the first time perhaps since October when restaurants and cafes were last open. So a huge sense of excitement. The 19th of May, really a date that couldn't come soon enough for many Parisians. Uh, you know, apartments in Paris aren't that big. People really happy to be out and about and having a chance uh, to see their friends. Um, this isn't a full reopening. This is uh, just step two of a four-step process uh, towards normality. It's outdoor seating only, as you said. 
50% capacity, so it's not quite normal, and that means tables are very hard to come by. Where I am now, at Plain West, they were fully booked at the beginning of last week. So if you want to come up, uh, come over here and get a table, I'm afraid uh, you're, you're, you're going to have to wait your turn, uh, Francois, and the same goes for anyone else. Um, so not business as usual, but plenty of excitement nevertheless. The weather, however, hasn't been fantastic. Uh, being out and about today, we've been at lots of cafes all over the, the, the French capital. Uh, and what's really striking is the minute one of these deluges starts, everyone gets up and goes. Can't be easy uh, to manage your customers when they're getting up and uh, disappearing the minute the heavens open. Um, but I get the impression nobody was letting it rain on their parade. Let's take a listen. We're happy. It's a place we've been coming to for a long time, so we're happy to be back. It's raining and a bit cold, but we don't care. We are international students, so we very looked forward for the restaurant's opening. And now we're very happy to see Paris, like in its original, let's say, environment. It's a surreal moment, actually. This morning on the bus, when I saw the terraces, I thought, oh yeah, these things exist. So it's surreal, but at the same time, it feels really good. So as we heard there, a huge sense of excitement that after six and a half long months, uh, life is taking a step towards normality for uh, people here in Paris. And as you said at the beginning, right across France, the same sense of sort of jubilation, I think you could say, uh, a little early to celebrate entirely because, of course, things are far from normal, but they're certainly heading in that direction. Yeah, they're far from normal, Matthew Dalton. Uh, we have uh, still a, a lot of people in intensive care units, uh, but the numbers are getting better. D d w w what's, the, what's the proper adjective to describe your mood this Wednesday? Um... I, I don't know if there's one adjective. I'd say waiting uh, for the rain to stop so I can go <laughs> and sit outside. It feels like every time you step outside, uh, you, you, it starts to rain. I mean, you look out your window and, and it's the, the shining sun, and then you go downstairs and it's raining. Um, so I, 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 hopefully the weather's going to be nicer tomorrow. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I think just relief uh, maybe is, is a good adjective, um, particularly... You know, for Parisians, Parisians live in, tend to live in really small apartments or fairly small apartments. So getting outside and being out in cafes is, is really important. And um, just, just for your sense of, of just mental health. And I think, um, you know, when you, compare, when you compare what France has gone through uh, to compare to other countries, the lockdowns have been really strict. Um, and, you know... In the U.S., outdoor restaurants have been open, you know, through the whole thing. Even some places, indoor restaurants. It's been it's been tough here compared to other countries. Uh, Alexander Lebrano, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, not just the last six months, but really the last fifteen months. How how's it been for you? Have you had second thoughts about staying in Paris, about living in Paris? Well, I would never have second thoughts about staying in France. Um, I'm actually not in Paris today. I'm in Uzez. After we spent the first lockdown uh, cooped up in our apartment in the ninth arrondissement, uh, three months of that was enough for me, thanks very much. So we've been in the country pretty much nonstop since then. Um, this morning, there was the same jubilation that everybody else described. Um, Uzez has a beautiful square called Le Place aux Herbes. And it was the first time that the cafe, of course, the terraces, terraces had been open a long time, and it was a market day, too. Um, and here there's gorgeous sunshine. I'm sorry for my friends in Paris, but it's beautiful mm. down here tonight. Um, I think that the um, I think that there's going to be, I mean, I'm, I'm elated for the, the return of the conviviality, which is such a, a crucial part of the pleasure of living in France in public settings. Um, I think we have to wait to see what the impact of this is going to be on restaurants. Um, it has been brutal. I mean, it's been absolutely brutal. Uh, the government has uh, admirably attempted to help, but um, with, you know, it, we went into this with a series of really difficult issues, whether it was the gilets jaunes, um, you know, there were all kinds of things that were happening. I mean, the tourism was way off even before the uh, COVID arrived. Um, and this has been a long time, you know, and I think that the, the knock on from this 
um, is going to be really serious. I think we're going to eat much. We're going to see simpler menus. Um, I don't know whether anybody else read this, but there was a big event today or recently in France. Alain Ducasse's restaurant, three-star restaurant at the very glamorous Plaza Atene Hotel is, is coming to an end at the end of June. Um, I think that a um, that we're at the beginning of a real revision of the gastronomic landscape in France. Um, and I think there will be some wonderful things, new things will come in. Um, Paris has never been more international, and there's some brilliant young chefs in the wings. Um, but I think that the traditional Christmas tree-shaped food chain of Paris, haute cuisine down to bistros and simple food, um, was already sort of moving, falling apart. Um, and I think the landscape's going to become flatter rather than pyramidal. Flatter rather than pyramidal. Well, we're going to take that up right now with uh, Didier Kemner, executive chef at uh, Plain West. Uh, uh, thanks for being with us here in the France 24 debate. Tom Burgess Watson telling us you've got a full house and you've had it for the reservations have been f uh, fully booked for a week. I want to pick up with you, Didier, uh, on uh, what you just heard there uh, from Alexandra Lebrano. H how brutal has it been? Did you ever at one point think, hey, I might have to shut? It, it was it was kind of brutal in the sense that we didn't know exactly how customers would react uh, because, I mean, there's still the fear of, of course, COVID and the situation with vaccination that's not really clear and that's not really fast according to certain opinions. But at the same time, we were so eager to, to reopen and we saw that people at lunchtime for service were so eager as well to come back to the terrace and being able to socialize, being outside. To give you an example, we arrived in the morning, I arrived around 8.30 a.m. because I prepped the day before and we're ready to go. And at 8.30 when we arrived, we didn't even set up the terrace yet outside and there were people waiting outside to ask for coffees and that's uh, that's unheard of so we're really excited about that and at the same time i think the fear really went away quickly today at lunchtime we had a full house and uh, and despite of the weather that was really crummy and uh, and not really cooperating we had a we had a good time and tonight we're fully booked uh, i should point out to viewers uh, you serve food from Brittany. i guess the weather went along with uh, the, the what was on the menu it never rains in Britain. Right, absolutely. The rain was just a little extra touch that was uh, free, uh, free of charge, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Let me ask you, uh, at this point in time, because I've read this, uh, a lot of restaurant owners deciding to stay shut until they have the indoor dining. For you, is this just about, because uh, uh, you, you're so eager to get back in touch with the customers, are you going to lose money? during this uh, intermediate period before you can reopen inside? I think, I think we should be able to break even in the sense that we should be able to, to cover all the expenses and make sure that we pay our, our producers and all that. We don't expect to make any money, but you know, the, the, the restaurant industry is, is so particular that if you stay closed for so many months, then you lose your crowd and you lose your regulars. So it was extremely important to reopen uh, for the neighbors, for, for all the people who know us, and also to, to make sure that we attract the, the, new, the new clients, because if you're closed for, for two long then you know that people are not going to come back and uh, and they tend to go to another place so we had to reopen and we're really happy to reopen i mean that we do it because we love it so obviously for us it was great to be able to reopen some making the calculation that it's not even worth reopening until after the summer your thoughts on that yeah yeah that's exactly it uh, it's, a, it's a very complicated situation. Uh, we've heard some, uh, some colleagues that are not going to reopen before September. We know that the star restaurants is another situation. We know that restaurants who don't have the outside only have the terrace, and obviously uh, we have the terrace, but restaurants who don't have the terrace will not be able to reopen only at 50% capacity as of June 9th. So all of that makes it very complicated for, for the, the math at the end of the month. But, uh, but I heard also that the government should be able to to give it a push until at least the, the end of June. So we're, we're looking forward to that. Uh, in any case, they're, they're not going to be able to unplug everything just like that because, as you know, if you have a loan and you have to have a, a rent to pay, those business models are based on a certain turnover that you have to make every year. And if we're only at 50 percent, there's no way we can make it. So we're going to need some help, that's for sure. You heard Alexander Lebrano saying how it's going to take a while to know just how much this has impacted uh, the, the, the restaurant industry. 
uh, that we're going to see a, a lot of famous names uh, be forced out of business and that, uh, uh, well, perhaps the offer might be slightly more homogeneous. He talked about it being more flat. Uh, your, your thoughts on that? In, in some ways, that's correct. Uh, I think there's going to be some kind of uniformization of, of the demand and the offer. Uh, and at the same time, it's, it's up to us also, the restaurant industry, to be able to, to attract the client and to make sure that we were capable of being diversified and, and please the, the, the customer as, as much as we can. In the past, we would do anything for the customer. We'd come and they would ask for a vegetarian meal and we'd prepare it on demand and all that. I think nowadays it's even more than that because if you don't want to lose business, you have to accommodate to a lot of, uh, a lot of things. Uh, I think it's going to take some time. I mean, we know where we are. There, there's the theater district. They're not reopened at the moment. In the summertime, they're closed, so they're not going to reopen before the fall uh, season. So all of that, too, is going to take a few months before we can engage again and making sure that uh, the demand is going to be there. So time will tell. Time will tell. Uh, Didier Kemner, executive chef at uh, Plain West, a restaurant in the 9th arrondissement in the theater district of Paris. Uh, many thanks for taking time out from the kitchen to speak with us here uh, on France uh, 24. Alexander Lebrano, your, your reaction to what you just heard there from Didier? No, I think Didier's uh, assessment of what's of what's coming is really true. I think that we really won't be able to see to begin to see the impact of the of this of, of COVID um, until after la rentrée, which is September. Um, and I think, though, that um, there are a lot of things at play here. You know, I think we're, we're, we will be emerging from a, a terrible trauma. And, uh, you know, there'll be an emotional fallout. And, and emotional fallout affects your appetite, too. What do, you, what do you want to eat after something like this? What do you want to eat after you've been stuck in your own kitchen cooking, you know, three meals a day nonstop for a year? Um, I can't wait. I mean, I am desperate to go out. I've missed restaurants, I mean, more than I can even begin to tell you. I miss the food, of course, but I miss the the soundtrack. I miss strangers' faces. I miss everything about restaurants. Is, is there like a particular dish? That, is there a particular dish you've missed from a restaurant? Uh, I've missed all the things that, I mean, my cooking is sort of umami bomb style. I'm not, I miss the cooking of restaurants like... Uh, Bernard, uh, Bertrand Grebeau at uh, Septim, or the brilliant young Franco-Malian chef Maurice Sacco's restaurant Mosuke, which opened. I mean, the poor guy. His restaurant opened in September. Um, he's a Franco-Malian who is madly in love with Japan. So he has three strands to his kitchen: France. Africa and Japan. The food's fascinating. He won a Michelin star, and then everything closes up. So the poor guy is, you know, sort of left on a bicycle in midair. Um, you know, I've, I've missed that food. I can't wait to go back and see what's been going on with him. Um, I think what I'm saying is just that I know how to make the bourguignon, and I can do. I'm pretty good with the cassoulet. What I've really missed is the, the you know, the creative stuff. I mean, I. After a while, you know, I think we've all been threshing through the internet and, and you know, reading cookbooks nonstop to try and find new things to eat. Um, I've never been more humble before the talent and the hard work of the chefs of France because indeed, indeed, we're going to we're going to Alexander, I'm going to interrupt you because we have to we have to take a very quick break. But when we come back, we're going to pick up on that very point. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. We're uh, wondering if cafe culture, if restaurants will be the same here in France on the day when lockdown is eased. It's outdoor seating only for the time being, but the COVID numbers are improving. We're in the company of former Paris City Councillor Anne Le Breton. Welcome back as well to uh, Wall Street uh, Journal reporter Matthew Dalton, food critic Alexander Lebrano. Uh, whose uh, upcoming book uh, is entitled My Place at the Table, uh, and that uh, it comes out at the start of uh, next uh, month. Um, Anne Le Breton, just before the break, we heard uh, Alexander Lebrano mentioning how COVID has perhaps changed slightly 
or or given us a new look in to as to what it means to go to a restaurant and what it means to prepare some of the dishes that are put in front of us. I guess for a lot of people that was quite a shock to have to cook three meals a day. Um, not for everybody, not, there's a half of the population that seems to have had a pretty good insight of that already. But uh, for some people, it was a big I, I tried change. to make risotto, I failed miserably. <laughs> yes. <just> so, uh, <laughs> but no, I, I think also what's happening is that uh, post-COVID is, is a terra incognita. We, we don't know what we're going to. It's not, you know, the restaurant business is completely impacted by what goes on in the rest of the world. And we don't have any idea. I personally think that uh, we're going to want a lot of change. You know, we're, we're coming out of a tunnel. We're going to want to have things, you know, bright and lively, indifferent, because we've had a really long, bad year, something that's not like a war, but that's not maybe so far from a war. So let me put to you the same question I put to Alexander. What is that dish you've been dreaming of that no. you can only get at a restaurant? It's not the dish. It's being served, being seated, not having to take the dishes off the table. It's the whole... The experience. It's the experience of going to a restaurant, having time to speak to the person in front of you, you know, quietly while you're waiting for your dish to be brought to you. It's, it's you know, the reason why people love going to restaurants. Well, living the dream is Tom Burgess Watson, who joins us again from the restaurant Plain West in the Theatre District of Paris's uh, 9th Arrondissement. Uh, Tom, we're, we're talking about how this moment of lockdown has changed our appreciation of the whole dining experience. It certainly has, Francois. And just to pick up on that, I'm going to teach you how to make risotto because it isn't difficult. And I grew <laughs> up in Italy, so I'm sorry you don't know how to make it yourself. I'll teach you. But here in the uh, Night Arrondissement at Plain West, it's it's getting chilly. It's not you know it's not for the faint-hearted. This eating outdoors business uh, in May, when it's probably only about 12 degrees centigrade. Uh, but to my left is a group of people with uh, uh, plenty of uh, enthusiasm and a great sense of excitement about being out and about. Uh, we have Isabel, Louise and Adele, I'd like to ask you, uh, first of all, Isabel, uh, what was the first thing you wanted to do when you came out to a cafe or restaurant? What did you want to order, first of all? I guess, as a French person, I would go for a glass of rosé or maybe red wine, depending <laughs> on my mood. Okay, so I'm assuming you've really missed going to restaurants. Uh, I mean, what, what was the hardest part about the confinement for you? I guess not seeing them and feeling fully, let's say, legit about it. And I guess just like being outside, seeing other people and just like enjoying my life after work, so to speak. So is this like a reunion of uh, old friends? Definitely. I've been doing them for more than 10 years now. Okay. <laughs> so it's, it's dinner time soon. I've been looking at the menu. Uh, what are we thinking, uh, Louise? We're seeking like uh, sea, sea, sea products, like fish, because it's a specialty here. Uh, it's a Brittany restaurant, like uh, really good, uh, good products. And uh, we are going to enjoy uh, French food. <laughs> what about you're keeping very quiet, Adele? What are you having for dinner tonight? Uh, I, I haven't had a look on the menu, but I think that we drink a bit too much of wine. <laughs> <laughs> but it's too much rosé for the night. <laughs> Is there such thing as too much rosé tonight? I don't know, but... <laughs> okay, so the 19th of May has presumably been in your diary for a little yeah, while. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, why did you come, why did you come here? Why was this your first choice? Well, yeah, because it's my uh, brother-in-law restaurant, so I invited my friends to come over and have a nice drink outside because it's shiny tonight uh, against all odds, but uh, it's nice, yeah. It's a nice weather to go out and... Yeah, I don't know what to say. <laughs> okay, well, uh, let me just say, enjoy your drinks. We've disturbed you enough. Uh, these are indeed very lucky diners because the weather hasn't been nice all day. Uh, there have been, it's been stop and start deluges, uh, but it seems like uh, uh, people who are having dinner this evening are indeed being treated kindly, and uh, it's not raining now. It's actually a very pleasant evening. So I'll let them carry on with their dinner and uh, back to you in the studio. All right, it's not all about food. It's also about the drink. We get the, we get the picture there, Tom. <laughs> Um, um, earlier this month, Matthew Dalton's publication, The Wall Street Journal, reporting how uh, no one group has had to roll more with the punches 
than the restaurant uh, industry. Uh, city landscapes across the U.S. have changed. Tables, chair, table chair, tables, chairs, and plywood structures sitting where cars used to park. Pedestrians sharing sidewalks with diners and space heaters. Thermometer-wielding hosts working double duty as health monitors. Um, interesting in that piece, Matthew Dalton, is cafe culture come to the United States because of COVID? Possibly. I mean, I think there are parts of the country in, in the U.S. where you just can't sit outside, uh, particularly during the summer, because um, it's just too hot. So you have to you have to go in and, and get your air conditioning. Um, and I think people are going to go back to that once it's safe. And, and they are already all are they already are going back to it. But yeah, in other parts, um, you know, in New York City and Boston and in, in big in some of the big cities, um, kind of like what's happening in Paris, actually, is that the sidewalk cafes have been sort of spreading out all over the sidewalk. Um, restaurants have been getting um, a huge, uh, huge new seating areas that actually may not go away once the once this is this is all over. Um, but there, yeah, there are other, all kinds of other things. I mean, I think generally speaking, uh, there's been a kind of big concern about about the safety of being in a restaurant, um, uh, e even being outside. And as cases go down, as people more and more people get vaccinated, I, um, I think that is going to go away pretty quickly. And you heard Alexander Lebrano talk about the fact that the menus are going to be smaller, perhaps. Is that is that is that I know is something that was mentioned in that article in the U.S. Is that yeah. is that what you that, expect? That's going to be a big shock. Is that going to stay? That, that's going to be because I think particularly in like America, in, you go to those diners. Yeah, and they have like exactly. 80 you things have, on the menu. You have like cuisine. Yeah, yeah, there are 80 things you can order, you know, sushi. You can order moussaka. You can order just like a cheeseburger. Um, that's kind of like a staple of New York City dining uh, or a New York City diner, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I don't think that's going to go away. But, you know. Also, it's I don't know if they it's like one of those the, the New York City diner. They do everything, but maybe not anything really well. So right. so I think uh, it could, you know, in, a, in more in a sort of more upscale restaurant, that could be more of a, a thing that which is already a thing, but it beca could become more of a thing. Alexander Lebrano, will COVID change the menu? I think COVID will definitely change the menu. I think there are a lot of factors that were that were um, coming along quickly before that. I think that we're all very aware of food waste, for example. I think that the idea of an encyclopedic menu, um, and it's true, I mean, you look at some of the American restaurant menus and you think there's no way that this, all of this could be good. Um, and there's also just horrific food waste. I think that the menus are going to shrink um, to be uh, more economical for the restaurant owners um, but also, I think there's a, a an accelerating. This has been going on for a while now. But I think people are they want to eat local, uh, wholesome, often organic, uh, locally grown things, and uh, you know that that focus on on local, seasonal, uh, wholesome, non factory food. Um, you know that's that's a major major thing that's happened. I mean, France. Even, you know, aside from all of that, I believe that France has the best produce of any of the major industrial countries. Um, the produce in France is extraordinary. Um, but I think that the, the, the menus will become more abbreviated to avoid food waste and to better showcase the extraordinary quality of the, of the produce here. And you, I think you, that I say to friends, you know, uh, people who will be coming, you know, hopefully this summer uh, on holiday to, to France, I'll say, you know, you're not going to see these gigantic, you know, these these extensive menus. Um, they are shrinking uh, for a, lot, a variety of different reasons, but it's in your best interests. You know, I think that the 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 shorter menu is in a way going to lead to higher quality. Shorter menu, high quality. You talk about showcasing. Uh, it's been a steep learning curve for many French restaurants, which perhaps weren't so digitally savvy. Uh, is there going to be a, a lingering effect there when people perhaps go less for takeaway, uh, but still want to be able to book their reservations online? Is that something that was already happening? I, with all, you know, I mean, I am a um, an ardent francophile, um, 
the, the as f Paris is much slower on the uptake in terms of, of you know computer reservations uh, systems. Uh, you know when I talk to restaurant friends or chefs, and I ask them why aren't you on Open Table or, or some of these platforms, and they say because I want I want to hear the voice of the person who wants to come and eat my restaurant. Um, I want to feel that you know I, I want to be in control of this. I don't want my restaurant to fill up anonymously. Um, I say, well, you know, that's not that practical if somebody's in Hong Kong and they'd rather make the reservations, you know, before they go to bed. Um, but I think that I think that there will be an acceleration for that. But in terms of delivery, I think that people will really back off that. I mean, I think that there are real major concerns about how the major food delivery platforms are have been exploitative. Some of them, of uh, in terms of how they pay the people who actually deliver the food who were actually frontline workers during a serious epidemic. Um, a lot of those people were not well taken care of. And a lot of the time the food looks beautiful when you're staring on it on a computer screen and then it arrives and you know everything's tipped upside down in the bottom of a paper bag or it's cold and you try to reheat it and it's never gonna be what it was in a restaurant. I'll be very glad to back off delivery services and actually to go out and enjoy the pleasure of being in a real restaurant. And Le Breton, what, what do you think the COVID effect will be on, on, on eating habits in France? I don't think it's only the COVID uh, effect because there is a generational uh, difference. I think the younger people are really, really tuned into uh, ordering food. And they were already doing it before COVID, and COVID has just, you know, multiplied it. And some younger people, and I mean, you know, people around their 30s, you know, people who don't have families, they order out every night. It's a, it's a way of living. So I think that will stay. On the shortening of menus, uh, I think that is a risk, the shortening of, of menus. And I think restaurants should really give it a really a strong uh, thought. Because sometimes I personally find the menus a little bit too short. Too and short. Yes, too short. Meaning that I read six or seven choices, and because honestly, sometimes a Parisian brasserie nothing, is, is a bit like a New York diner. And there's I too know, many things and I on the hope menu. the brasserie, because the brasserie that is a specific type of restaurants, and I really recommend tourists to go to brasserie. Which, uh, when you a French person goes to a brasserie, they know they're going to get seafood. They know they're going to get you know traditional French dishes. So really look out for brasserie. It's it's a really a specialty. And in brasseries, you do have a, a large menu. And I think that will continue. I think some of the other restaurants should be careful uh, because sometimes they, as one of the chefs was talking about, you have to cater to all tastes and also people from different origins with, you know, all the gluten-free and vegetarians, vegans, halal, kasher, everything. And you, some of the restaurants do not cater, do not really look into who they're catering to enough maybe. And their list is a little bit short. I often find myself wondering if I wouldn't like to have twice as many uh, choices. So uh, as a consumer, I'm not sure. And definitely, I hope the Brassie will keep on their long tradition of a long menu. Matthew Dalton, are you a plat du jour, a special of the day kind of guy? Or do you agree with Anne Le Breton? That oh, you can the, do both. The menu should be long. <laughs> I think it should, I think you should have choice, though I think like, yeah, sometimes in some brasseries, the menu is just like too long. And, and particularly in New York diners, it's like, uh, it's much too long. <laughs> All right. We, we heard there Alexander Lebrano mention uh, how uh, those um, people from the gig economy uh, with those delivery services uh, were essential workers during the, uh, uh, during confinement. Um, now the recovery is so strong in the U.S. that we're seeing wages rise sharply, not just for them, but the restaurant workers themselves. Uh, McDonald's last week said it will raise pay for workers in its 650 company-owned stores in the United States to an average of $15 an hour by 2024. Entry-level employees will make uh, $11 uh, an hour. Now here in France, Matthew, we have a a stronger social safety net. Uh, obviously, the minimum wage is much higher. Mm. Um, but do you see uh, if the recovery is strong, mm. that uh, this too could uh, make for uh, it could be uncomfortable for some restaurant owners who rely on, let's face it, 
mm-hmm. paying uh, low wages. Yeah, definitely. And um, I think particularly in France you know, and, and in Paris where, and, and all over the world, a lot of restaurants are small businesses. They don't have the scale that like McDonald's has actually. McDonald's can afford to raise wages for, for the millions of workers that work there, but a small restaurant, you know, that th- these are low margin businesses often or no margin businesses. So yeah, I think that's gonna be a challenge for the industry. Um, and you know, learning how to, to do things more efficiently um, is going to be is going to be key to that. But um, yeah, I think it's you know, and in the U.S. there was this dynamic where um, uh, it's it could be a bit temporary because the, in the U.S. the stimulus um, gave a, a lot of gave very generous unemployment benefits to to a lot of workers, so that did create this incentive for some of the workforce to stay on the sidelines, and and that effect is gonna is gonna go away. Nevertheless, I think the the U.S. economy is really strong right now. It's pu- it's putting a lot of upward pressure on wages, and big companies can afford it. Uh, small restaurants, small mom and pop restaurants, maybe not. When you look at France and the United States, Alexander Lebron, is it like trying to compare apples and oranges? No, I think very much so. I mean, I think as you pointed out, um, you know, on the one hand, uh, France uh, has an extraordinary. Uh, social, um, you know, uh, protection system, and, you know, outstanding education, retirement, healthcare, uh, and everything else. These are things that are either, I mean, you know, in the U.S., it depends on what state you live in. I mean, there's so many different factors that, that, that determine that. And, you know, I mean, people often in Europe don't understand how, how different it is from one state to another, even from one city to another. France, there is that, that the, the social safety net, uh, net is, is strong. And it's a huge benefit for restaurant owners because uh, a lot of those things, a lot of those extra ch- charge, and they are showers and it's expensive. But on the other hand, there's there's really good value for money in the the outcomes of what you pay into in terms of taxes, the outcome of what the quality of the health care is. Um, all of those things eventually get paid for in the United States, but they get paid for often in hidden ways. Um, but I think that, you know, as um, as we've been discussing, uh, restaurants are small businesses. And I think that that's where my... Uh, my concern is knowing many, many, many chefs. I mean, the fragility of these small businesses is, uh, so, as, as someone else said, I mean, the margins are almost transparent. You do this work because you love it. I mean, you you know, it's, it's, a, it's a true labor of love. Um, will they be able to come back? And will tourism rebound quickly? Um, will business dining come back? I mean, I'm hearing, you know, from... Uh, friends of mine uh, in in Paris, I mean, the city, Paris is in the midst of the most massive uh, ch- changes in its public works landscape since Baron Haussmann. And um, some people love it and other people don't. Um, some people find it really difficult to get around the city unless you're riding a bicycle. Things like that will have a big impact on the restaurant business because people might not go out for a business lunch because most of those people are not going to go out for lunch on a business lunch. I'm not talking about corporate people um, on bicycles. I mean, you could say maybe it'll evolve and maybe they'll do that. Perhaps that's true. But I think the the return of the the different streams of revenue for the restaurants, I mean, their neighborhood restaurants, their headliner restaurants and expensive hotels, um, you know, we'll see. And I don't think we'll really have any real idea about it until the end of the year. I think that uh, I think that there is a staunch desire. I feel it and hear it from friends in America and uh, Australia and South Africa, all over the place. They can't wait to come back to Europe. Um, yeah, the- I hope they come and I hope they spend money and I hope they go out, you know, they eat out three or four times a day because well, the flip, the we flip- really need them to fill the coffers. Of, Matthew, uh, Matthew Dalton. Yeah, the, the flip side of the rising wages and, and rising costs for restaurants is also that the economy is very strong. Um, and there's a lot of pent up demand for people to go out dining, I think. And so you're going to, I think, demand for restaurant services is going to be great in the next year or so. I just, that's that's my sense. One final question, because we're out of the time. Ri- the rise of salary is also due to the fact that we have now a much stronger uh, group of educated people and a lot less people who are willing to do those jobs. So mechanically, 
uh, I think we're going to see those salaries rise everywhere in the Western world. And, and that, that's... Uh, that's a positive thing, is what you're saying. Just one final question. It's a thing. It's and and Le Breton, uh, one final question. We have... Um, you, you heard there Alexander Lebrano mention, you know, more and more people are going to be working from home perhaps a day a week when it's all over. Uh, mm -hmm. the, so the, there may be fewer business lunches uh, as a result of that. It's going to change everything because the real estate business for uh, is, is changing completely. A lot of companies are looking into reducing their office space and, of course, reducing. So their will there be fewer space. people in Paris Few or will they be dependent more on tourists? I don't. I think there will be, uh, there will definitely be fewer people in one given office on a given day. So that will affect business lunches, but they might develop them in another way because people who work from home in another neighborhood might be going out for lunch with a friend that day. You know, if they're working from home. So it's it's really too early to say how it's going to affect. But definitely, there are going to be people going to work from home at least. Uh, you know, a day, a week, I think. All right. The dust has yet to settle. Anne Le Breton, I want to thank you so much. I want thank to thank you. as well uh, Matthew Dalton. Thank you. Uh, Alexander Lebrano for joining us uh, from his escape uh, lair in Uzès in the south of France. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.